I'm Langdon Hammer. I am sitting here with Robin McGowan. We're going to have a conversation about his uncle, James Merrill. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a rainy day, late September, and we're in the chair's office in the English department at Yale. Good to see you, Robin. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, uh, I, you and I can talk about so many different topics. Um, you uh, knew your uncle for uh, si close to 60 years, five decades. Probably longer. Probably <laughs> longer, yeah. And, yeah. Um, I, and, and you also uh, knew him in settings and scenes that um, others today don't recall um, wouldn't have uh, uh, had first-hand experience of it. One of those is the orchard, mm -hmm. um, Charles Merrill's estate in Southampton. Um, let's start there. Uh, in some ways, uh, the story starts there. Yeah, well, he, by the time I invaded, I think, his rooms, and we, we had a hurricane in 1944, and, I, and we moved out of Cooper's Neck Lane because of the hurricane and came to stay and watch the trees crash at the orchard. Mm -hmm. And I stayed in his apartments, I remember, mm -hmm. just over on the second floor. And that was really where his life uh, began, I think. It's right over the staircase going down into the kitchen, which must have been a great source of consolation. <laughs> and away from, but around the corner was his father's bedroom, I think, which was still um, used then. Mm -hmm. And he would have had his, his nanny's room right next to him mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And there would have been, a, I guess, at the time, but I, you couldn't tell then, fixed up for the puppet theater. I remember though seeing his butterfly collection um, in a far room off of the music room, uh -huh. and his equipment, of course, for impaling uh, <laughs> his insects. His butterflies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a net for catching them. Uh -huh. and, um, and I already, by then, I had inherited his uh, world stamp book. Mm -hmm. Which it was, uh, gave me part, I mean, it started off, I guess, to both of our wanderlusts. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, um, How interesting. Yeah. T t tell us more. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you've ever told me about the butterflies. I would have put it in the biography. <laughs> that, that's such a good story uh, that this uh, poet who uh, identified with butterflies would have been. Uh, Catching them and, um, and and it led to I think his in interest in Nabokov, uh -huh, or could right. it, yeah, or partly. Right. Yeah. Um, tell me more about the orchard. Uh, you mentioned the music room. Um, yeah, the the it was this double story. Um, what's his name? White. Great. The thing he himself designed. His firm designed the. Stanford White, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. They designed the house yeah. in, I guess, 1907, yeah. just about a year before he was killed. Mm -hmm. um, you entered the music room through this small conservatory that was tiled, very small, mm -hmm. and then you mm -hmm. were thrown into this super uh, projection, and then you pass, uh, which had organ pipes all around, mm -hmm. and probably where he would have been playing the piano, mm -hmm. I would mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, really a very good pianist who wanted to be, a, uh, be able to play anything. Mm -hmm. A concert pianist never quite got there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it really didn't stop him, unlike it stopped other people from playing the piano. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And other people realized, I, I mean, Tony Hecht mentioned how important he thought uh, Jim's piano playing was to mm -hmm. his poetry. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh huh. So, um, the orchard is on a just a extraordinary scale. Um, it's uh, um, 
33 rooms. Couldn't, couldn't be more grand. Um, very different from James Merrill's other homes. <coughs> yes, yeah. Um, I'm, 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 I'm no attempt really to live up to it in any way in the, in the other homes. Mm -hmm. So there is an effort to get, I think, to get away from all that scale, mm -hmm. and also to get away from nature, the <laughs> gardens. I mean, uh -huh. it, there was a fabulous Italian garden behind there. Right. There were this whole clamor of red setters mm -hmm. behind, with, with which he, Jimmy identified mm -hmm. greatly, um, that, that led on by the, uh, the great painting of Mike, the uh, prize setter, who discovered the affair with Natalie, as she's called in the book, uh, Dottie Stafford, mm -hmm. in a, a bedroom. Mm -hmm. um, and that, the, that's, it's, it's interesting having all that there. The, I, I was struck by, and um, tried to rope it in by Mr. Henderson, who was the controlling eminence behind the eight gardeners. There were also 12 servants. Mm -hmm. the, um, and the, the, oh, his father had his own valet. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure what his, whom his mother had to help her dress. Mm -hmm. But that's also part of Jimmy's and our whole family's interest in clothes, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. was supreme. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know. um, Describe that interest in clothes uh, from the family perspective, and, and then James Merrill's interpretation of it. <coughs> um, for, for us, it was always comparisons between his father, Taylor uh, Van Sickle, whom he stuck with, and for to, to wearing his suit, uh, got his first job in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, my, fa my father's tailors, they're plural in Rome, mm -hmm. and in Genoa, mm -hmm. and so on. And my father kept trying to lure uh, Charlie to try out his <laughs> tailors, and eventually they got to Rome and, and these, uh, which is another story, I think, mm -hmm. there. Jimmy's uh, has a poem. I think uh, written towards the end of his life, yes. thinking about uh, his love of pink uh -huh. things and green trousers. Yes. And I inherited a green suit of his that I, uh, of a, I eventually gave away, but it was a beautiful suit yes. that he always wore to readings in late life. Mm -hmm. Before that, he was in black mm -hmm. because of uh, James Dickey's. Uh, effort to tag him as somebody living in luxury. Uh huh. And he wanted to keep it more simple. Uh huh. Keep his presentation more simple. Uh huh. The, he, uh, uh, there was always, with, uh, everybody remembers his Birkenstocks, mm -hmm. which were accompanied by colorful socks on mm -hmm. top of that. Mm -hmm. the, and there was, but always, uh, I mean, which struck out what, the way he walked, mm -hmm. just uh, throwing his hips around mm -hmm. as he walked, mm -hmm. kind of si sidle, uh, I don't know whether that's the right word, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it's a, mm -hmm. a cross, mm -hmm. and which, which made him, sort of, he was always on the make, and that's in, in a certain sense, or flaunting himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, 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 but on the other side of that, there was nobody I knew who ever met him who did not think that he was a poet. Uh -huh. He always came across as a poet in front of other people. Mm -hmm. In a way, I may have tried to come across as a poet. I <laughs> know what the result that was. When, uh, so he was a he was a uh, he was a poet in public, and he was a poet in private. <clears throat> yes, and uh, no, I. Oh, and his Volkswagen had Pollock on uh, the back of it on yeah. the license. Right, 
Yeah. I mean, no one should be proud of this. Uh -huh. yes. Yeah. Let's talk more about houses and, and uh, yeah. domestic spaces. Um, you visited um, 107 Water Street when it was uh, new to James Merrill and, and when uh, James Merrill and David Jackson were first decorating it. You know, can you describe your, your, your impressions when you first walked through the yellow door? Uh, sir, you walked up these very, very steep stairs and then all of a sudden you were thrust into this extraordinary space with the dome, um, dining room thing. The, uh, the upstairs hadn't been uh, rearranged yet, mm -hmm. which would become central mm -hmm. to that house. Mm -hmm. So you were, you were in this clubhouse, basically, that was, which had stained glass windows. Mm -hmm. and, uh, the, um, we, I used to stay in David's apartment. Uh -huh. Uh, um, or and if I had my girlfriend with me, but she might be there too. Mm -hmm. But I don't think she was there originally. Mm -hmm. uh, and David would move over into Jimmy's bed mm -hmm. there. Or and later on, I would stay in the little bedroom off of the kitchen. Little bedroom off of the kitchen. I'm trying to think where yeah. that would be. Oh, but all to the right of the, to, as you were facing this way, it would be to the right of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. A very small sort of a guest bedroom, or, or place for the unwanted guest to <laughs> be thrown out at, at, at a party. Uh -huh. so, uh -huh. so, and at that time, uh, uh, it was always David who talked to one. David who greeted yeah. one, greeted us. Yeah. David who hoped that you would return, uh -huh. and Jimmy sort of sulked or, or, or hid himself in the kitchen preparing dinner, uh -huh. which would always be marvelous. Yeah. And at the end of the visit, I mean a day or two later, he would come out and he would start talking mm -hmm. to him. But it took a lot mm -hmm. of effort to get him out then. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it, uh, there was this point, he still didn't have contact lenses. Mm -hmm. He wore these very thick glasses. Mm -hmm. On noni cards, you would see um, Cosmo Alvaz or various mm -hmm. uh, 1890 type uh, people just doodled away. Mm -hmm. and, and there would be signs of the self hatred that we probably all have. Mm -hmm. But if his was. I think the self-hatred for is not quite acceptance of his gayness mm -hmm. at mm -hmm. that time. Mm -hmm. Eventually he came to accept himself that way, as, as if there were no other identity possible for himself. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, describe David for us. Uh, David in David circa 1955 then, uh, when, when you were first, first meeting him. You've, you make him out to be very gracious and very gracious, very attractive. Mm -hmm. um, they're quite handsome. Mm -hmm. um, we'd, we'd stay, uh, 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 or maybe this is a little bit later in David's apartment on First Avenue. Mm -hmm. There, uh, he was wanted to be the host and, uh -huh. and help. Oh, Jimmy, in any way possible. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, and I remember when I was about 17 or so, uh, at that time, they would go to, uh, in a little rowboat out to a sand spit. Mm -hmm. and, um, and once for me, they took along a, a nymph of the town uh -huh. out, out there. <laughs> we all had a picnic. Uh -huh. And um, the nymph and I, we're, we're both innocent people. We, yeah. We um, sort of fell for each other. Uh huh. Yeah. So that would be Sandy Point. Uh, yes. Yeah. Today, um, not a barren sand pit, but um, a beautiful sandbar covered with pleasure boats. Uh, oh, wow. you know, hundreds yeah. of boats. Yeah. Yes, yeah. On a weekend. Um, let's. Uh, Let's yeah. change the decade and, and change the locale and describe 
Describe Athens in the early 60s. Yeah, um, the house was a much more formal house, I think. And I, I remember, it was hard to find. You asked for the Naval Hospital, and you eventually got up to where it was, number 44. Mm -hmm. And you went in there um, through a downstairs, um, a very small open port thing. Mm -hmm. and on the, there was an immediate a piano right there as you came into the house. And then Jimmy's student study right opposite on the, on, on the right hand to the right of the door. But I was always steered around, not by David or by whoever greeted me, around the corners mm -hmm. and up on through these metal, uh, mm -hmm. I guess, terracings mm -hmm. to the, the terrace on the roof, a, a very big terrace mm -hmm. with vines behind it mm -hmm. and a wonderful view of the Parthenon at the time. And which lasted for at least another ten years. Mm -hmm. um, that was, um, and, and we would sit there and gossip, and other people would arrive, and we would all go out to dinner together. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, Jimmy took us a, um, around, drove us to Sunion, took us to where he went swimming, uh, off of, uh, on the way to Sunion, mm -hmm. I suppose, but much near Athens. Mm -hmm. And we would eat in a tavern there, and it was and there was a whole charm of life, and, and that he was spelled that he was under, but I became quickly under as well. Mm -hmm. That was. Um, Tell us about that charm. The, it was a charm so that every time I descended on Athens in, in a plane, I'd be weeping. Mm. It was just moved me so much mm -hmm. just to be back there. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there. There were a few cars, I think. Mm -hmm. the, uh, when we arrived, we left our car. They had to take out their car every year to uh -huh. not have to pay vast taxes on it. Yeah, and uh, and they were very grateful to have our Fiat there while mm -hmm. we were sent off to Iran. Mm -hmm. the, um, and, and I think Jimmy, uh, I, every time I ever spoke to him about Greece, he always said he, he liked it just as much as I did. Mm -hmm. And he was had not, never really disillusioned by this. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I don't think, but it was not quite the same Greece that we both liked, but mm -hmm. it had a lot of in common. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was the, uh, Greece was, I, I'd been in love with Italy. And uh, landing in Greece was to find oneself in, in a much simpler world, mm -hmm. and a world that's much easier to understand for that reason, mm -hmm. and a world of black and white uh, rather than mm. these wonderful um, colors of mm -hmm. stucco buildings and things, mm -hmm. and, and a need for shadowness and the extraordinary ability to see great distances. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. Geek uh, described that there was no middle distance to mm -hmm. any view you had. There was just a front thing of maybe the iron railing, the pergola against the wall, and, and then a vast sweep of distance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at that time, I, th I think we, were, we went off to Hydra. Mm -hmm. We saw uh, immediately, um, my wife's, I think, mother arrived. Mm -hmm. um, we had to take her around the Peloponnesus. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming back, being offered a, a large scotch to calm us down <laughs> from riding with this lady who couldn't stop talking. And the only way we could get her to stop talking was to go around perilous curves so she had to lie down on her <laughs> stomach in the back seat. And quieter. Yeah. And, we saw, and the record would keep returning to the same nervous subjects. Mm -hmm. so. um, I am thinking about the, that terrace and 
the um, socializing that you were part of. Um, James Merrill loved parties, as his parents did. Um, tell us about some. Yeah, they, they, there, there, everything started with Tony Paragori. Uh huh. They, I mean, Tony was the sort of party central. Mm -hmm. We went to um, um, Prime North Sale. We went on the excuse of picking up letters to Tony's antique shop, where uh, and then ha had a news out there. Mm -hmm. Then turned up at Jimmy's, mm -hmm. and then we would go out to Kalanaki or elsewhere for dinner with him afterwards. Mm -hmm. The parties were, they were small ga gatherings. When I, I saw qu quite a bit of the, um, the, his goddess who was the daughter of the former mayor of Athens. Maria. Maria, yeah. yes. Maria Mitsutaki. Yes. Uh, yeah. But she was really Tony's best mm -hmm. friend. Mm -hmm. And the conversation often involved Tony's Alexandria stories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Often not told by Tony, but by David or Jimmy had memorized them all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, uh, when we were chatting, a little while ago, before the camera started rolling, you were telling me um, about another party that I was interested in, the uh, one involving uh, the, the eels. You, know, yeah. you, you need to explain that. But, I, but this is by hearsay, <laughs> yes. That in Jimmy's uh, New York apartment, before he was, got himself away to Stonington, he had a, a first floor apartment it's a, really a basement apartment because you went down, his quarters were in the basement with a garden behind mm -hmm. that probably was never used. And there was a, a um, people said, there were, uh, Jimmy talked to me about the, the wonderful way in which you could have fish as a conversation mm -hmm. uh, media. But mm -hmm. he had an electric eel, mm -hmm. which is more sinister. <laughs> and the electric eel would light up every three minutes. And at parties, apparently, people had to compose trilets, I think they were called, uh, in the intervals of the lighting up. And it was this, this was the, I guess, remnants of the formal 40s, uh -huh. which, out of which Jimmy and his friends came. Mm -hmm. But I remember also a, a party of uh, um, David Jackson's apartment. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, maybe after uh, or before, uh, after Kim and Fryer had been in it, mm -hmm. and um, maybe uh, in which all, all his New York friends were assembled. Mm -hmm. I remember Daryl Hine being there mm -hmm. and how. Um, impossible and uh, really, I didn't want to be connected with any of these people. <laughs> and it was all part of Jimmy assembling a menagerie mm -hmm. that, he, that he liked or mm -hmm. that he could stand mm -hmm. or that interested him. Mm -hmm. But it did not, uh, it appalled me uh -huh. at the time. Why did it appall you? Or what what, uh, what um, turned you off? I don't, I don't, um, I'm not sure why. Mm -hmm. No. There, um, there was a sort of, maybe there was a sort of nastiness associated mm -hmm. with John Myers, uh -huh. with, with uh, Herbert, uh, with Herbert Manches, uh, and a lot of, uh, um, Jimmy's friends were, were mostly not, um, not with it people. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, whereas I, I, I'm, I'm not sure I found Larry Rivers' friends um, so much more attractive, but the, but they were uh, you understood them better. Uh -huh. No, uh -huh. there was something um, difficult about these mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. No, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, we haven't talked 
really uh, about the family and um, uh, your parents, James Merrill, their relationship, um, Jimmy's relationship to your brothers as an uncle. Um, describe, describe how he fit and didn't fit in the family. <coughs> well, uh, actually, he thought my family and my brothers were all impossible. And my brother Stephen, who appeared at many of his parties yeah. and so on, was someone who uh, and which accompanied us to Japan later. Mm -hmm. But they didn't get on at all. They both were both talkers. They both mm -hmm. wanted to dominate the conversation. And it was intolerable to uh, Stephen that he could not do this or wasn't permitted to do it or wasn't sought out to do mm -hmm. this. It just had to be part of the entourage. I didn't have this problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, um, uh, Jimmy, uh, I think, wasn't really to uh, tolerated by or oh, had a mixed reception by my mother, mm -hmm. so, which, which changed later. She became very proud of him. Mm -hmm. and, and at that time, he was writing her very nice poems about her being pregnant with Mark. Yeah. I was connected to Jimmy through uh, his, his father. Mm -hmm. And since I really liked his father, um, it was a way and we could talk about his father, and we could talk about um, his problems on, on and off, and his efforts to see himself, or, or try not to see himself as his father's doing the same thing as his father, mm -hmm. like throwing money at any problem mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. uh, eliminate it. Mm -hmm. So he didn't like having to do this, but it's not a bad thing to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a lot better than being mean mm -hmm. to people that you want to get rid of, or so on. Mm -hmm. See, and, uh, and and he was at the time he was writing a, a book about his father. I mean, the seraglio was more about his father than about my parents, mm -hmm. who are really the villains of the book, mm -hmm. and are, are, are aren't very are gone into for very deeply. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, while we're on the subject of the book, um, wh what do you think of the family portraits that are, are there in the novel? Um, I, you've just suggested something about, about um, your parents as they appear. What about, um, what about Charles himself, Charles Merrill, uh, who's Benjamin Tanning right, in, in, yes. in, the, in the novel? Uh, yeah, Tanning is he's seen, I think, in, in a sort of emasculated, or not in, emasculated by his heart attacks. Mm -hmm. uh, he hasn't quite ha had his uh, atomic cocktail mm -hmm. at the time yet. Mm -hmm. So the radiation uh, treatments so, that he'll so have. So you just see him in, in his beautiful yeah. clothes mm -hmm. and surrounded by this entourage of women who are hoping to marry him or seduce him or, mm -hmm. or profit off of him uh, with good reason. And that's, um, and he's reduced to this uh, former potentate who's now lapsed into a kind of, certain kind of, not quite senility, but old, but a, Harmless old age, mm -hmm. and he's a benevol benevolent figure in in me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you're not aware of him criticizing Jimmy or making life hard for him. I think mm -hmm. they would reconciled them, themselves mm -hmm. before this, and uh, and Charlie was always sort of supportive of, of Jimmy, and mm -hmm. also saw that he needed certain things that perhaps he would never get. Uh, do you recognize your grandfather and all that? Uh, yes, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, more than recognize, I learned so much about mm -hmm. him. I would never have seen the sexual side of my grandfather mm -hmm. without J Jimmy's laying it on me. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessarily in the book so much, it's just in conversation. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it was something I aspired to, something like um, uh, his 
father's sexual side. Mm -hmm. I thought I passed this crown, a curse of it had passed on to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I wanted to no, no, and since I had no sexual experience of my own, mm -hmm. it, was, it was useful having a model of a kind. But, you know. Was he a, uh, a sexual model for his son, too? Meaning Jimmy? I think he became one. Mm -hmm. I, I think Jimmy's, um, I want to say, profligacy mm -hmm. had something to do with his uh, father's constant skirt chasing and was a vocation mm -hmm. for his father. He was on the hunt. Mm -hmm. And there was any, any adored women. Mm -hmm. And he would change when any woman came into him. Well, even on his, mm -hmm. on his deathbed, I, mm -hmm. I remember oh, my girlfriend coming into his room and all of a sudden, wow, a whole <laughs> adrenaline <laughs> came into him. Yeah. And he just came alive. Mm -hmm. I don't think Jimmy that had that kind of effect on him, but that's yeah. uh, do you, do you, was James Merrill on the hunt too? Um, yes, I think so. But later on, mm -hmm. he couldn't be on the hunt at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was in the uh, '70s and the post and the liberation mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. I remember Jimmy talking about uh, uh, wide-eyed about this marvelous times later mm -hmm. on after mm -hmm. they all faded behind AIDS. Mm -hmm. what, how wonderful the opening out had been into just being able to fuck anybody mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and how much he needed that. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. uh, and it, it strikes me still as a sort of male, you should be able to try everything. Uh -huh. There's, yeah. Um, now, we've been talking for quite a while now, and I think we've hardly mentioned poetry. Um, is there a relationship between this appetite and um, attitude towards the world and James Merrill's poetry? He, he felt that he didn't have his father's um, uh, when we played the, uh, I forget what it's called, a sort of nature game. Mm -hmm. of the landscape game, Land yeah. Yes. His notion of going into the sexual world was having a, a bowl of celadon, which mm -hmm. he filled with, uh, half filled with water. Mm -hmm. And that was just enough sex he felt to irrigate his art. It was yeah. not a consuming thing he wanted to watch, uh -huh. but he was also living with David at the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. And they were, I think, still lovers. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was only when, mm -hmm. after David mm -hmm. had moved away mm -hmm. and changed to uh, on the feminine side, mm -hmm. um, that Jimmy was forced to look outward. Mm -hmm. But even then, he still didn't, ha didn't ha have recognized his type yet. Mm -hmm. um, I think Strata was the uh, revelation of the type mm -hmm. and what could happen. Mm -hmm. uh, um, talk about, about Jimmy's poetry and your sense of him as a poet, where it, how it fit in his daily life. Um, you were, you, you talked about him earlier as being um, aware of himself as a poet, presenting himself as a poet, uh, always sort of styling himself in this role. But that's different from actually writing poems, of course. And, and um, can you talk about that piece? What, what, you, what were his habits? What were his motives? Uh, I, I, I never saw the stacking of rhymes, the preparation of going into writing a poem. I just saw the, I always seen in the beginning just the writing of the seraglio. Mm -hmm. And for him at that time, being a poet was, he came out of the, those first poems, and I remember telling me how much he disliked them. And I, since I also disliked them, we agreed on this. <laughs> yeah. and, and then later on, 
he had uh, a few poems mm -hmm. written in, in Mallorca, the, uh, the Hotel de l'Univers de Portugal, which mm -hmm. is one of my favorite mm -hmm. poems, but there were very few. And I came to really like his short stories, mm -hmm. which was published by Claude Fredericks mm -hmm. in a beautiful little volume. Mm -hmm. And I found it somewhere. And that busyness of it and the, all that really attracted me very much. Mm -hmm. And then, but there was no, there was not the, uh, the, the, the poems that would liberate him weren't there yet. Mm -hmm. And, um, maybe they shouldn't have liberated him. Maybe he could have stayed with the Hotel de Lidiver, the <laughs> Portugal. No one else thinks this way. Yeah. And the, uh, the Sixth's poem, The Thousand and Second Night, and the beautiful tenants, uh, that tendency finishes that volume, The mm -hmm. con Urban Convalescence, which is an extraordinary poem. Mm -hmm. all, uh, were all things I could relate to, mm -hmm. and, and they were happening at that time, especially urban convalescence mm -hmm. was there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that whole feeling that the moment you became attracted to a place in New York, it, um, it was torn down. Yeah. That's yeah. the thing. Um, yeah. But, but at the time, though, I think he was wanting to be a playwright, Wanted mm -hmm. to be a novelist, um, and did not c really consider himself a poet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. And then later on, he, he, I remember he was telling me that you should do, you should do what you do well, which is just a, a cop out that he later came to regret. Uh, how so? Um, because it's it kept you from doing things you do poorly. Uh huh. Uh huh. You know, I and mean, later on, when he went to after Japan and with Peter Houdin, he started writing back again things they couldn't write well, like plays, little plays for Peter, uh -huh, uh -huh. the Santos thing. Yeah. And yeah. I think that was, that was um, and he envied the Japanese being able to dismiss themselves and take on another name and broaden themselves this mm -hmm. way, not being trapped mm -hmm. in, in poetry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, he really regretted um, being the last formalist, that's, as he saw himself. He uh -huh. didn't see any uh, people following him, mm -hmm. but he would create them with his Ouija board thing, mm -hmm. and, or by teaching. Now that you mentioned the Ouija board, let's talk about that. Um, did you watch Jimmy and David doing it? No, never. Um, no, and I never saw him writing it, these things down. Mm -hmm. Jimmy did it with me once, and mm -hmm. I w I'd written a lot of alphabet poems, mm -hmm. and I couldn't get away from the letters of the alphabet mm -hmm. to think about any sort of content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or the content was the letters for me. And I noticed that all the vowels were on the left-hand side. He had a curved uh, uh, Ouija board mm -hmm. when, we, we, when we did it. Mm -hmm. And there was, and it worked when you when you no not no, really not, not particularly <laughs> no no no, <laughs> no. Um, you you mentioned your trip uh, with uh, uh, Jimmy and Peter and um, uh, Stephen and Octavio to um, Japan in, in 1986. Uh, Tell us about that occasion. It, it, was, it would not have existed without Donald Ritchie, mm -hmm. who was the presiding spirit of it, as well as Jimmy. Mm -hmm. Jimmy by then had uh, succumbed to AIDS, was traveling with a huge uh, box of medical supplies, uh, and was and, and, and was obsessed or not obsessed, but wished that he hadn't gone there uh, because of, uh, but he felt he was betraying David Calstone. Mm. But the, the trip originally came about because Jimmy wanted to make a trip with me. Mm -hmm. And he would go anywhere I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. I suggested Bali. Mm -hmm. And eventually, um, he and Peter decided that they didn't like the idea of themselves 
from the back of a motorcycle <laughs> traveling, looking at things in Bali. Mm -hmm. It didn't it seem to them not as, as stylish as mm -hmm. going to Japan and buying Peter a whole trousseau of <laughs> stuff. <laughs> um, and, and watching Jimmy shop in Tokyo and so on, or anywhere, mm -hmm. was a revelation. I mean, it sort of outdid my mother. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> and that was, uh, but Jimmy, uh, at that point, I, I had a lot of difficulties because of Jimmy's need to control. Mm -hmm. And I felt I had been controlled by him, and, uh, and, I, and he wanted me as, like I think all writers want people to take to further their views to mm -hmm. t take them on, and they're not. Mm -hmm. um, and besides having liberated me as a writer, that was one thing. And mm -hmm. he always saw my difference from mm -hmm. himself, but he also wanted to control me. He liberated you and controlled you. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> so, there's su successive stages, I mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. um, so. And I, when we were in Japan, I didn't, I couldn't make, get myself to even say a word to him for at least maybe ten days. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then, and then he brought up wanted to talk about my po my poems. Mm -hmm. and we got going a bit, mm -hmm. but it was um, it was hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. You weren't aware then of his illness, or at any rate, you weren't aware of his diagnosis, and. Uh, tell us a, a little bit about um, his last years of his life and uh, your relationship to him um, while he's ill. The, uh, just, uh, I think in April, before he died, Octavio Feliciano mm -hmm. had met him at the opera mm -hmm. and immediately accused him of having AIDS. Mm -hmm. Um, Jimmy didn't deny it. Mm -hmm. and then Octav Was Octavio himself sick then? No, no. I don't yeah. think so. And then Octavio told me that I'd better see Jimmy because he didn't think Jimmy had much more time to, to live. And I had seen Jimmy sort of irregularly mm -hmm. since, uh, like since come, I'd seen him in, in England with Peter mm -hmm. and I'd seen him uh, uh, I visited him at Stonington here and there, and I'd also mm -hmm. seen him in New York. I pref much preferred going mm -hmm. to Stonington, where you could sp spend the evening, uh, um, have a good meal, mm -hmm. and, and get a lot done. And also, going to Stonington was life-changing in the sense that that place is for everyone who goes there. Mm -hmm. It just has a fantastic oxygen mm -hmm. of art that mm -hmm. Uh, that's, it's hard to s feel that in normal life, but there it was being produced for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, but then after Octavio told me, then I saw Jimmy all the time I could. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. In fact, um, you had, I think, Thanksgiving together, is that right? Uh, 1994? Uh, we, we had not so much, no. Oh, it was a Christmas. We had, had Christmas, Christmas just before together. he died. That's right, yeah. And, and just before that, um, I remember turning up, uh, uh, oh, he wanted to take me to the movie Red. Uh-huh. Um, I think he'd already written the Christmas tree poem, which I think is, is my other favorite poem of his. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were walking across the park, and he was walking much better than he, in June, Oh, when he, oh, I think Peter had taken a home in, in Lakeville, mm -hmm. so, uh, but I didn't see much of Peter and didn't mm -hmm. want to see much mm -hmm. of Peter. Mm -hmm. the, and, and as we were walking across the, the park, he said, I don't have to be brilliant to me. Uh -huh. And I didn't say anything, <laughs> but it's something that I guess all, and all of his people have been thinking that he really didn't need that. Mm -hmm. And he realized that, I think, in, in writing the Christmas tree uh -huh. poem. Uh -huh. it's, and it's in, in the, uh, I think often 
the poem's inner persona, of a dog's voice and so on, allowed him to be simpler mm -hmm. and to use his empathy for um, in place of his brilliance. Mm -hmm. And that was, was so wonderful, getting that. Mm -hmm. And I felt at the time, walking across, that he was in much better shape mm -hmm. than he was in June, that he was making progress, and I didn't really... And, and then after that, we had him for uh, Christmas at our house. Mm -hmm. and he was in much Salisbury, more, yeah. yeah. and he was much more lively than all of us mm -hmm. put together. <laughs> and he could perfect, because he was hyper. Mm -hmm. had more, um, so my mother and father, they mm -hmm. all had much more energy than I had mm -hmm. to project. Mm -hmm. But it was, that was impressive. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the time, he was really looking forward to getting his um, eye operation, mm -hmm. getting rid of the cataracts. Mm -hmm. And of course, he would only live another six weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, um, but, uh, the, but going back to Tucson, I think, meant a lot to him. Mm -hmm. I remember the books he had with him. He had a lot of Henry Green, mm -hmm. which he wanted, I think, to do dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, there are and, and some nice poems on, mm -hmm. on the koi. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of tenderness coming from them, mm -hmm. and that was, uh, and then the the episode of his uh, being given morphine to treat his heart attack. I wish I remember that in 1956 on his round the world trip, he'd gone into an opium den in Bangkok, and realizing he would not be in an opium den again. He wanted to get as much out of it as he could, and uh, took several pipes, mm -hmm. and his heart stopped beating, mm -hmm. which is a sign of something. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the same thing, I, th I think, when he had morphine. They, they, they may have given him morphine to help him out of his pain, or, or possibly to hasten him into the next life. But, uh, they, but I thought if it was to get him out of his pain, they should have been aware of his susceptibility to, um, or his lack of susceptibility, of lack of tolerance mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. the, for this kind of um, persuasion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think maybe we're there. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've covered a lot. Yeah. Yeah.